It's a pleasure to uh, partner with the Investment Company Institute in putting on this program. Uh, Paul Stevens came to me over a year ago and su suggested we do a program like this. And, and, and to be honest, uh, my reaction at the time was with everything else going on in the world, uh, why should we concentrate so much energy on a one-day conference like this? And uh, as I studied and learned more about the issue, I, clearly I was wrong. Uh, this is an incredibly important issue, and it's uh, uh, significant that we have assembled the speakers today. So, Paul, thank, thank you for uh, your initiative on this. Um, this isn't just any day. This is the day that the stress tests uh, are released, CCAR as they call them. Um, and that's symbolic of the important, uh, importance of the issue. Uh, suppose, for example, that uh, Fidelity and Vanguard, and na name, your, uh, name your suspect, uh, was a SIFI. Uh, and today they found out whether they could pay dividends or buy back stock, or what lines of business they could engage in, or whether their risk models were right or not. Just imagine if that were the scenario. Well, first of all, there would be very, very few people in the room. You would be, be back in your shops uh, waiting for the, uh, uh, the bunkers. Um, so that, I think, uh, as much as anything else, proves the, the significance of, of our topic uh, today. Um, but let me just, if I could just digress uh, with a little editorial comment here, and I know you didn't come to listen to me, but um, full disclosure, um, I happen to be a Democrat who believes in sound regulation. And as a Democrat who believes in sound regulation, I am appalled at the trivialization of regulation that has gone on in our nation's capital particularly under the guidance of the Federal Reserve and Governor Torillo. We have made our regulatory system so complex uh, as to be nearly infathomable. We have made complexity a competitive tool, as Hester has pointed out in some of her, some of her writings. We are, we are not on the right path in that regard, and I think uh, we've lost sight of uh, Mark Twain's maxim, you all know it, that I would have written you a shorter letter if I had the time. I think it's high time uh, for uh, more purposeful regulation, sounder regulation, that not just Wall Street lawyers can understand, but actually bankers and maybe even citizens can understand. Um, and taking the uh, the the exhortation of Andy Haldane at the Bank of England, England we, shouldn't make, uh, we shouldn't fight complexity with complexity. In that regard, you'll probably hear a lot of speakers today talk about uh, cost-benefit analysis and how it's important to take that uh, requirement uh, from the securities laws and, and graft it onto uh, the bank regulata regulatory process. And I think there's a lot of uh, merit to that. Personally, I would buy into it on one condition. The FSOC, the Fed, have determined that too big to fail is a permanent condition. They have no intention of eliminating too big to fail, as Dodd-Frank requires. The very verbiage in Dodd-Frank requires it. So, so if we are to make cost-benefit analysis apply to regulations in the banking world going forward, then let's do a cost-benefit analysis of too-big-to-fail banks. A regulatory decision has been taken to allow them to continue to exist, notwithstanding a, a statutory mandate. Let's do a robust cost-benefit analysis of the very existence of too-big-to-fail banks. I'd be willing to uh, wager on how that might come out. In that regard, can, can we do a, a brief poll? Are we all awake here? We're all awake? Um, we all know our right hand from our left. Right hand means yes, left hand means no. Three questions. First question, 
We are five years almost after the enactment of Dodd-Frank. Have we eliminated too big to fail as a policy? Yes, right hands? Two? Uh, no. Oh, let, let the record show that there were two rights and uh, considerably more no's. Um, five years from now, five years from today, do you think, given the path that we are on, five years from now, we will have eliminated too big to fail as a national policy? Yes, right hand? No, left hand. Let the record show that there were three right hands and one person feels that we're on the right path. I'm gonna guess that there are, for the audience uh, at home, <laughs> I'm gonna guess that there are what? 90 people in the room, 80 people in the room? Uh, so it's uh, roughly 87 to. Final question. Right hand, do you think asset managers or man asset management should be designated as SIFIs. Right hand, yes. Left hand, no. Okay, I, I saw no yeses and all noes. Um, now, you, you might ask me why right and left? I mean, you could have had, uh, just you, you just need one hand to count, right? Well, the Fed has a 300-page uh, uh, proposal on, uh, on why you use right and left. Uh, and it's out for comment now, and you're, you're, you're I don't understand the difference, but uh, perhaps, perhaps you, can, you can figure it out. Um, so our center at BU, the Center for Finance, Law, and Policy, was set up to uh, engage in issues like this, but not from the standpoint of one particular school or college, but rather from the standpoint of the entire campus. Just like the systemic crisis itself, we feel that the answers to the systemic issues are not, not just in the law school or in the economics department or in the business school or even in the school of German journalism, but rather the answers come from the collaboration of all of the parties. So policy is in the title. Um, I left at the door uh, a piece of legislation that I personally, not BU or not on behalf of the center, uh, have been working on that deals with the too big to fail issue. It's a bill uh, uh, that would require 341 word, not page, uh, change to the statute uh, and would, I think, result in all of those votes that say that we are not on the right path for, towards eliminating too big to fail to change overnight. So I invite you to pick up a copy of the statute that's an, also an article about it. That's policy. Out of this conference, and this goes back to an original conversation that Paul and I had, we're gonna raise, probably not resolve, but certainly raise many issues. And our center and Boston University would enjoy being part of the research that uh, results in resolution of some of those issues. So I invite you to communicate with Paul or me, and perhaps we can develop some partnerships again on, a, on an interdisciplinary way here at Boston University and help uh, resolve some of these issues. Um, Brian Reed, where are you? Oh, you're here, good, wonderful. Uh, Brian Reed uh, was, the, was on the staff as an economist of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System for seven years, eight years. For the past uh, 10 years, he's been the chief economist at, at ICI. Um, Brian and I first met when we debated, this is in the uh, heat of the money market mutual fund issue, you remember it, in New York, and we, we exchanged pointed uh, but uh, friendly words. And uh, before this uh, Bloomberg audience, and I said, "Well, geez, you know, he's from Washington, so he must hate me, no, right? I, because we disagree. Because everybody in Washington hates each other if they disagree, isn't that the way? <laughs> there, there's no, there's no uh, camaraderie anymore." 
Um, but after our very candid uh, and, and uh, enjoyable exchange, Brian came up to me and said, that was great. Let's get together again, have a cup of coffee or a drink. And we did, you know, which is exactly the way it's supposed to work. And let me just uh, close and, and uh, hand it over to Brian, who's going to give us a uh, high-level view of the asset managed industry by saying, that's our responsibility. You know, if Washington is going to be irresponsible, whether it's foreign policy or regulatory policy, if they're going to be irresponsible, then it's up to us to be responsible and hope uh, through our efforts that they will shine through. And I think Brian's uh, reaction, I think, is emblematic of that. And let's uh, let that be the tone for the day. Is we, we will certainly disagree on a lot of things, although my informal poll showed a little bit of consensus. But we will certainly agree on many issues. But let's agree not to be disagreeable, if we might. Brian, it's yours. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Khan. Um, and that's right. We, there, there are, I think there are many ways to approach issues, but I think having a dialogue and being able to have an, uh, that dialogue to talk back and forth about how one understands the issues really helps to develop policy and to develop deeper thinking about the issues. And so what my uh, objective here today is to give a lo some level-setting comments about asset management and to foreshadow some of the comments that I'll have on the next panel um, that Craig invited me to be on. So an overview of the asset management industry. Um, three things here. First of all, what is asset management? And this may seem like a very trivial, well-trod uh, issue uh, because everybody knows what asset management is. But I do find many times in the conversations that I have, there are very important distinctions between asset management and other types of financial intermediation that aren't fully appreciated. And so I think trying to lay that groundwork is very valuable. But also, the next, uh, the next point that I'd like to make is what is their role in capital formation? Because one of the things that really stands apart in the United States from um, really virtually every other economy is the central role that asset markets, uh, that securities markets play in the channeling of capital. This is not the case in Europe or even many of most of the other Anglo countries, but rather something very distinct about the United States, as Paul pointed out last night, really was part of the foundation and formation of our nation's um, uh, federal government and our markets was with the creation of the U.S. bond market um, in, in 1790. And then finally, uh, talking a little bit about what do we see in terms of investor behavior? How do investors react during periods of stress? Uh, and, and the characterization that has been put forward already is that um, in, in, a many, in a many different juris, uh, in, in a many different conversations and in jurisdictions is that we have investors who are really moving in one direction. And so my goal here at the last part of my presentation is provide you some evidence to show you that that is really a mischaracterization of how investors react, even during periods of stress. All right, so who are the investors? Really four major groups in my mind. First, individual investors. And in the United States, we have 93 million individual investors investing in publicly traded funds such as mutual funds and ETFs, uh, closed-end funds, investing in $16 trillion of assets. Uh, you have another group of investors which are endowments and foundations. Um, then there's a large group of investors that are many of them individuals and others through the uh, U.S. pension system, either defined benefits or defined contribution, where there's another $24 trillion that are sitting there. Some of that is invested in mutual funds, obviously, in 401ks and the like, and so there is some overlap there. And then finally, there are corporations, uh, high net, um, uh, state and local government, sovereign wealth funds. Uh, these largely, in, at least in the United States, are using money market funds. They are not heavy investors in stock and bond funds. Right. So how, are, how do asset managers then deliver their services? Well, there are various types of products and services that are done. First of all, you can do it through a collective product, such as a, which I'm going to just call a fund. Uh, these may be publicly offered, like mutual funds or ETFs, may be privately offered, like hedge funds or private equity funds uh, that are available to either uh, high net worth clients uh, but are not generally available to uh, the standard uh, uh, middle class American investor. Uh, collective investment funds are a common feature within pension plans. Uh, even some 401k plans will use a collective investment fund. 
uh, a similar type of uh, framework that a mutual fund has uh, because there's a pro rata interest in the fund, but the regulatory structure around them is different. And then finally, there are separate accounts. Um, and, and separate accounts are really a way for individuals, uh, corporations, uh, pension funds to invest directly in the security. So rather than pooling it together in terms of a fund, you actually are holding the securities directly in an account. You're a direct holder of the securities as opposed to a fund. You actually, as an investor in a mutual fund or an ETF, you're not owning the securities directly, you're owning a pro rata share in the fund. The fund owns the securities. All right. So within that framework of the types of products that are being used, there are also a variety of investment strategies. The bulk of the investment management industry, uh, and this is you know, the, the bulk of mutual funds and ETFs as well, really are long-only strategies that are investing in stocks, bonds, and money markets. Increasingly, some of these long-only strategies will have a layer of uh, uh, some kind of a derivative exposure. It may be because um, the derivative is providing a way to get uh, greater liquidity at lower transaction costs to a particular market sector. So you can create a synthetic exposure, for instance, to a corporate bond by holding a U.S. government security and then writing CDS, for instance, or doing a total return swap, synthetically creating it that may actually give you far greater liquidity than if you're holding that cash instrument of, a secure, of the bond itself. Then there are all long only strategies that are in non-tradable investments. So again, these would be in such things as private equity funds. The, most of the investments in those would not be eligible to be put into a mutual fund, for instance. And then finally, we see a, a group of funds that are, have been out there. Hedge funds use some of these strategies where they're alternative strategies. Um, these may include long short strategies, uh, leverage strategies, commodities. We're seeing some of these in, in mutual funds, for instance. Uh, but Keep in mind, those strategies are less than $200 billion in the fund space, um, in the publicly offered fund space. So one of the interesting aspects of the conversation that we've been having over the last several years, and this is a conversation that has been going on for several years, is really what is the distinction between what an asset manager does and how a bank intermediates? The, the key here is that when, a, when you go to a bank and you make a deposit, that deposit is um, helping to fund the balance sheet of that bank. The, the losses, the gains in return, other than the interest that you're being uh, uh, provided in return for your deposit, those losses are being absorbed by a small amount of capital that sits on the balance sheet of the bank. So in, in many ways, then, you can think about if the, if the price of the securities rise or fall in that bank's balance sheet, the, 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 the deposit doesn't rise or fall in value but rather the capital itself rises and falls in terms of how much capital is available. Uh, this is very different from an asset manager. So this is that, what the bank is a principal business. The, the asset management is an agency business. What happens is that the investors will come to the asset manager with an investment mandate. What do I mean by that? They will say, I want to invest in large cap domestic equity or small cap value. The asset manager may do a variety of things. First of all, they have created funds, potentially publicly offered funds, that have that investment strategy in their investment objective that they're legally obligated to follow. Uh, they may also uh, create a collective product for you, put together a collective trust, or even put you in a separate account if you have a large enough balance, where they'll, they'll create that separate account around the mandate that you're providing them. But this is at the direction of the investor or the financial advisor that's intermediating on part of the investor. But the key difference between banking and, and asset management is the capital doesn't go to the asset manager. The asset manager is not holding the capital, is not exposed to the risk. That risk is all borne by the investors who are providing the capital into the fund or into the separate account, as well as the ownership and risk return back. So every day, at the end of the day, a mutual fund, an ETF, has to reprice its, price its portfolio. And the reason is, is it's adjusting basically the, the, the liability side of its balance sheet for the value of the assets and so the two of them equal. Whereas in a bank, the only thing that's adjusted every day is how much capital is left because all of the risk, whether the returns or whatnot, all flow to the underlying capital. So how does regulation then of publicly offered funds limit the risk? Well, m much of the regulation within the asset management space is really divine, uh, de uh, designed to protect investors, their investor protections. 
Um, all of these, for instance, for instance, there are limits on borrowing and leverage within uh, a 40 Act fund, within a mutual fund, within an ETF. These are designed because the fund is actually on its end every single day required um, to redeem shares that are put back to the fund, that is, provide the cash back. And so to make sure that the fund has adequate assets to do that, 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 that the amount of um, uh, borrowings don't exceed the amount of assets that are there, there are limits on the amount of leverage that can be there. Uh, they're required to have a very simple capital structure. So when you go to a fund, you own shares in the fund. There are no subordinated classes to those in which those individuals or even senior classes where individuals may have a senior uh, claim on the securities. There is, there is one share within a mutual fund. Closed-end funds can have a somewhat different structure um, with, with um, a, a, a borrowing class that, or a leverage class that's put out, but those are still limited in the, in the amount that they can provide in terms of the capital to that closed-end fund. And then in addition, because the fund is providing redemptions on a daily basis and selling shares on a daily basis, it has to have adequate liquidity, it must mark to market its uh, portfolio, uh, it must be diversified, and so all of this is designed to help provide orderly redemption uh, on the part of the fund. The implications of this are, is that, for, as I said before, the, the investing is, the, uh, the risks of investing go to the investor, not to the asset manager. Um, and and I, this can't be stressed enough because that very key aspect of it uh, defines sort of the, the, the features of asset management. In addition, asset managers generally don't take on investment risk. Um, that remains their clients. They don't guarantee or promise returns. Um, there is no government safety net undergirding. So during the financial crisis of 2007 and 2008, there were, there were emerging market equity funds that lost 70% of their value. 70% of their value was lost. This is not because we had 70% of the assets come out of those funds. It's because the markets in which they invest in fell by 70%. Now, if that's not a large market movement, I don't know what is. And yet, we still didn't see large investor outflows, which I'll get to in a minute. All right. So taking this broad overview, then, of the, uh, what publicly offered funds are, and I'm going to move now into that publicly offered space, to give some sense and sizing of the size of publicly offered funds. So not only in the United States are there publicly offered funds, but in Europe and in, in virtually every other jurisdiction <coughs> globally. Uh, if you look at the total amount of mutual funds and ETFs uh, globally, there are about $33 trillion. A few weeks ago, um, the head of the Bank of England said that this $33 trillion was invested in highly illiquid securities. Right? So for clarification purposes, most of that $33 trillion is actually invested in stocks, government bonds, not highly illiquid securities at all. But that $33 trillion is the publicly offered funds that are out there. The, then, if you break that down for the United States, there's about, uh, there's about $16 trillion that's in mutual funds, another nearly $2 trillion in ETFs, and then about $400 billion in closed-in funds. Other types of funds, just to give you some sizing in terms of the private funds, are about $9 trillion. Uh, and then collective investment funds, the, those that are used in retirement plans, a little over a trillion. So what is the importance of the collective investment funds, the publicly offered funds in the United States? Currently, households in the United States hold about a quarter, little under a quarter of their overall financial assets in publicly offered funds, mutual funds, ETFs, closed-end funds. Uh, this is up from 2% in the 1980s. What, what has been the big increase and who's been the net loser? Well, the, the amount of assets in banks have risen over time as well. What's really happened is that a bulk of this has, has moved from individual investors holding individual stocks and bonds to investors holding bond, stocks and bonds through mutual funds and ETFs through, um, um, uh, in this collective fashion. A lot of the growth has come about because of the rise of the 401k market and the use of four, uh, mutual funds and, e and ETFs within, within individual retirement accounts. This has been a really a shift in the way investors invest, but also as the growing use of 401ks and IRAs in the United States has democratized 
investing and access to the capital markets for investors. Um, it has increased the percentage of the population who's actually invested in the markets as well. And so we have nearly half of Americans now investing in the capital markets, whereas in the 1980s, early 1980s, it was more like about 5%. And this is really, in many ways, parallels the rise and the growth of the 401k and the IRS in the United States. What share of the, of the markets do these publicly offered funds uh, actually uh, manage? Uh, about 30% of U.S. corporate equity is being managed by a publicly offered fund. 19% of the bonds that individuals in the United States are owning uh, are held through these publicly offered funds. And, I, and, I, in, and on this caption, we say U.S. international corporate bonds. If you look, though, at U.S. funds investment in global bonds, non-U.S. bonds, U.S. funds hold about 1% of the non-U.S. bonds in the world. 1%. We have seen sort of reports and concerns about the rising role of funds in these markets. Um, and yet, I don't understand how 1% can be sort of a, a level of systemic risk, uh, even if you take the conjectures uh, put forth by why publicly offered funds um, are potentially systemically risky. So that really provides a segue then for me into the really where the argument has now boiled down. So this has been an evolving debate. It's been a conversation that we've been having back and forth with regulators, with policymakers, with academics about what have been the trends that we've been observing, what are the risks, and what are the sources of those risks. And I think in this next panel that Craig will be moderating, I think we'll get to the heart of these issues. But let me foreshadow a few of my thoughts here. There are two. Uh, primary ways in which, at least this point, policymakers have uh, conjectured that funds could be uh, a, a source of systemic risk. And the first is this notion of herding. Uh, giving the sense that investors, during periods of stress, move monolithically in one direction. Right? That, and what we looked at, and we've looked, this has been an issue that's arisen for, for generations, actually. So going back, one of my economists has gone back and found references to this in discussions of the 40 Act when it was put together. In the late 1950s, as mutual funds were then maybe 1% of the overall capital markets, people began to worry about funds and the redeemability and potentially the pressures they could put on capital markets. We saw this argument back in the mid-1990s when funds were then uh, about being held by roughly half of U.S. households, that now this was the time that we were going to see these types of uh, sort of uh, unconstrained uh, herding and movements that could totally disrupt the capital markets. Um, and yet, during this entire 75-year period that we've looked at for funds, we've never seen that. So the question really in our mind should be, why haven't we? If, if the conjecture is right that people do herd, then why haven't we seen this herding already in 75 years? Now, this isn't to say that individual funds cannot have sizable outflows or sizable inflows in any period of time. I'm going to show you some data here in a few minutes that actually shows the fact. But the, the point of herding is, is that you have this concentrated monolithic movement in the market that is so incredibly disruptive. Everybody in all funds are moving in the same direction. One reason that we don't see this uh, is that 95% of U.S. stock and bond fund assets are held by retail investors. Um, half of these are being held in retirement accounts, so they have long-term strategies. They're not looking to, to play the market for a short-term gain. And the bulk of these investors, if they're not investing or if they're investing outside of their 401k, are using a financial advisor. Almost every single day, I just saw an article yesterday in the Wall Street Journal talking to financial advisors and what they do to counsel and advise their clients, even during periods of financial stress, to make sure that they remain in the funds. The last thing that you really need is investors pulling out and, and not being exposed to the asset class, which they have paid and, and chosen to invest in because the market is moving against them. Because as, as folks even like Jack Bogle have pointed out, the last thing you want to do is try to time the market. Right. And so this mantra that has been, that has been placed and, and onto the table that's been repeated uh, over and over again is, is, is by and large how investors operate. So here's a chart that provides some data to that, to that point. What I've done here is taken all the bond funds uh, in the United States and looked at their flows as a percentage of assets. Now, if you do this for the entire industry, it's the red line. And what we show is that flows uh, as a percentage of assets, even during periods of stress, such as 2008, those outflows, those net outflows, amount to about 1% or 2% in a particular month. 
right? Now, certainly, there are funds in any given month during a period of stress, during a period of calm, that have much greater inflows. Um, that's the dotted line. That shows the top 10th percentile. And you can see that even during periods of stress, there are funds that are having net inflows that are as much as uh, 5 or 10 percent of their overall assets. There are funds that have outflows that are as much as 5 or 10 percent of their assets. But what's key here is that the red line is in the middle of all of these. That is, this is a relatively closed system. That the money that is moving out of one fund or one group of funds is moving into another group of funds. That this is money not on net leaving the system or going into cash or, or the like. So even during periods of stress, we see this. One of the reasons for this is that redemptions, which are the putting the shares back to the fund, and sales track each other very closely. So let's just look at shareholder redemptions for a moment. And again, put this into context. This is, a, this is the total redemptions on a monthly basis from uh, all bond funds in the United States. So keep in mind, bond funds hold about $3.6 trillion of assets. If you take these flows here as a percentage of assets, they're at, even at the peaks of those redemption uh, peaks, uh, we're running at about 4% of assets are being redeemed. Those are the sales, new sales almost parallel with those redemptions. When the money is coming out of one fund, there's money coming into that same fund or into other funds. These offset each other as part of that closed system. Why? Well, much of this money stays with retail investors. They're working with financial advisors. They may be moving from one type of fund to another, uh, but this money is relatively stable. So in some sense, this notion of monolithic movement on the part of investors um, is, is a really a crude mischaracterization of the actual actions because the bulk of what we're seeing, going back to the redemption numbers, even during the height, the, the total redemptions are about 4%, netted out from the new sales, they're more like 1% or 2%. I can even do this for high yield bond funds. So I'm not trying to camouflage anything. If you have questions, I'm happy to provide this for any other investment objective that we track. Um, look at the period uh, in, in the, uh, October of 2008. Junk bond funds were down 20% in value. Okay. The outflows that month were about a half of 1%. All right. The volatility of these funds in terms of their returns does not lead to volatility in, in flows. I can do the same sort of breaking out. We don't see that same monolithic behavior again across funds. There are junk bond funds that are in net inflow during periods of stress. There are junk bond funds that are in net outflows during periods of stress. Uh, what's, what's telling to me, though, is that if you look at 2008 when these funds had massive losses, uh, we were seeing actually by the time we got past October, which were pretty mo modest outflows in total, net inflows into these funds because the yields had risen so high because the prices had fallen so much. The second thesis is that funds create a first mover advantage, and, I, and we're going to get more, more into this into the next panel. Really two points here. It's number one, it's number, the way that funds are priced and their mutualization. Uh, make a couple of points here. Much of this has already been, pre -under, have been understood, have been anticipated, the way the funds operate. So they're using fair valuation. Many of the funds use bid pricing rather than um, uh, they're either required to use the mid or the bid. Uh, funds have redemption fees. Um, e even in the extreme, funds can do a redemption in kind, and this is a standard practice for ETFs. But the really the important point here is that if you move out of a fund during a period of stress, um, this is not a risk-free uh, transaction. There are transaction costs in doing that. There are transaction costs of moving into an, in, if you want to stay in the asset class. And in addition, if you're sitting out of the market, the market can move against you very quickly like it did in 2008, and you're going to have lost whatever, even if there is a modest amount of transaction cost you're trying to avoid, the market can quickly wipe that out by moving against you in, in a very short period of time. The second part of the, uh, of the first mover advantage is the way that portfolio managers are managing their portfolios. There's this notion that's being sort of discussed right now that fund managers use a waterfall approach. They go through their most liquid assets first and then leave the remaining shareholders with an increasingly less liquid portfolio. Right? 
When we talk to asset managers, this is anything but the truth. And the reason is, is because this would quickly leave your portfolio not only out of sync with your prospectus language, with your mandate, but it would also leave the um, uh, recognizing that the fund managers have a fiduciary responsibility to all their investors. And creating that type of portfolio for those investors who remain behind would be a, would really, it would be a violation of that fiduciary responsibility. So they don't manage their funds in this way. One way to see that is to look at the, the cash that's a portion of the, of the balance sheet. And this is, again, for high yield funds. And what's notice, noticeable here is it's really mean reverting. Very seldom does it go much below four. And certainly, against the hypothesis that this is a waterfall, that the cash is the first thing to go, we see no evidence of plunges in cash value. I mean, you could potentially be going negative on this chart because you could be borrowing, you could be wiping out all of your cash. We see no evidence of that whatsoever. So I'm going to pause here um, uh, so that I don't say, take too many of my remarks for the next panel. Khan, I think I'm getting close to running over my time, but did you want me to take a couple of questions, or do you just want to move in? OK. All right. Thank you. So I'll, I'll answer a couple of questions. I'm being told I have five minutes. Yes. Hi, I'm Bill Grimes uh, from here, Boston University. I'm uh, the director of research at the center. Uh, thanks for your remarks. Uh, the part that you left out, which perhaps you're going to be uh, covering in your panel, is of course the the people who actually do move, uh, which is the corporates, and uh, we see that particularly in the money market funds. And that, as I understand it, that's where all the regulatory conversation is right now. Uh, is the question of of how do we shift the the, the regulation of money market funds? Do we shift from uh, you know from from uh, uh, from the unit value, from the, the do, do we allow them to break the buck? All of those uh, questions that come up. But as far as I can tell, it's all about the the activity of corporates who are using these things for for cash management purposes. So, if you're going to be doing it in the next um, panel, please. Uh, I'll, I'll, let me handle that. Me. I think there's two important points here. First of all, the SEC has done two very significant rulemakings on money market funds just since the financial crisis, and this is not to any way. Uh, diminish what had been done with all the rules that were put in place prior to the financial crisis. I mean, the, this, there's this kind of concept or belief that money funds are lightly regulated. In fact, they were the most uh, uh, heavily regulated part of the fund industry. So to your point, what the, the, latest, the last set of rules have done is said, if you're going to offer a prime fund, and if you're going to, and that is those funds that can invest in something other than government securities, uh, then a couple, of, and you offer them to an institutional investor and allow institutional investors like corporations to come into your funds. First of all, beginning uh, next year, they will have to price these out to the one basis point. So to the fourth decimal place if you're putting it out to $1. Um, this, this, uh, this level of precision is well beyond what's required uh, uh, by any other fund, by any other probably security in the market, but we are going to, we are going to be required to do that. Secondly, gates and fees have to be in place so that if the fund does not have sufficient internal liquidity, that they can slow the process of the outflows uh, by putting in a gate or charging a liquidity fee to uh, have the exiting investors pay for the, the cost of their transaction. In addition, the funds can also suspend redemptions, which was part of the, the first set of reforms in 2009. So what is happening then is we're beginning to see is the market's beginning to shift. So we're seeing some of those, uh, some fund companies offering, uh, re, uh, take, taking some of their prime funds and turning them into government funds uh, and moving their institutional investors there. And we'll see this market evolve, but the type of movement that we saw from prime into government funds. So just to be clear, the corporations didn't leave money funds. They just went into government uh, funds that were invested only in government securities. Um, we, will, we will see uh, the effects of these rules going into place over the next uh, 18 months or so. Hi, Susanna Duncan from State Street. Just a couple questions on your premise with herding behavior, lack thereof. Most of the underlying data that you use was related to, actually all of it, I believe, U.S. mutual funds. What if you were to take the institutional landscape into consideration because they are notoriously guilty of buying high, selling low, right? So if you were to apply that institutional lens, knowing this may not be your bailiwick given that you're focused largely on the retail side. Second piece to that is the underlying data that, that I saw at least was related to bond funds, but what if you were to apply equity funds? Because clearly something happened in herding behavior when the market's all tanked. So Someone's doing something. <laughs> so let, let me pose this, uh, make this point. When I sell my house in my neighborhood, I reset the price for the entire neighborhood. 
I don't need everybody selling at one time to reset the price either higher or lower. When we talk about herding, we, see, we seem to have this concept that it's the volume of transactions that's setting the price, as opposed to the market resetting the price at a new price point. Right? So the question when we see prices move, as they did in the stock market yesterday, um, the, the storylines in the newspaper are, well, a lot of people are selling. Yeah, a lot of people are buying. Right? We're resetting the price point. So I think that's the first, that's the first point that I want to make. Secondly, there can be volatility, and there's no doubt there is volatility as the markets try to search for the new sort of price that they're willing at which transactions can occur. Uh, the question is, is that it's not about necessarily about the volume of, of selling or buying. Now, certainly there can be periods where there are, um, you, you, the prices have to move a lot more to bring additional buyers into the market. Uh, that's partly the way op markets operate. One, one thing that I think, and we'll get to this on the panel, I think it's important to distinguish, though, how bond markets operate from how short-term markets operate. Short-term markets, it's very easy to get to a corner solution where no one wants to lend. The reason is, is you can't charge a high enough interest rate on a one-day piece of commercial paper or a repo to cover your risk, right? So at some point, the investor is going to simply back away. You, you, you just can't charge, get enough interest on an overnight to cover that the risk of loss. In the bond market, interest rates can move and do adjust. Uh, and I think that is an important distinction that needs to be kept in mind when we think about this. So um, you're right. I do have a lot of uh, information here about retail. That's what we cover. Stock markets, the information I have here looks very similar. Uh, the reason I focused on bonds is that's largely where the um, regulators are focused right now. Khan, should we move into the panel? Yeah. Okay. 